Welcome to a lecture on clustering techniques. Uh, my name is Ben. I'll be your instructor for this lecture. Uh, the first note is on project two, actually. So project two, uh, hopefully you've started the analysis. Um, one way to sort of uh, make something extra compared to what's available in the rubric is to sort of look through checklist of analysis techniques. So if you know of uh, a checklist that you've come up with in class, you could certainly use that from all the things that you've learned in lecture, or you could learn uh, other techniques that are available from these checklists. So I'm going to post these slides. They'll be, a, be available to you um, and take a look at those. They do include things that we have not covered in lecture. I'm happy to go over any of the topics that you see in those checklists um, uh, outside of lecture. Um, I won't have time to cover everything this semester, but there's a lot of great um, checklists for data science available. All right. As I mentioned, uh, we're going to talk about clustering this evening. This is both numerical clustering um, and document clustering. We're about two-thirds of the way through the semester, so if there are topics that you really want to um, talk about this semester and you don't see them on this list, It'd be a great idea to talk with me and let me know what you're interested in. So today we're going to cover different types of clustering, um, and sort of this wanders in the machine wanders into the machine learning domain, but uh, we'll consider it sort of exploratory analysis for 601 purposes. And then we'll also look at text analysis, um, and that includes regular expressions and stop words. All right, so for a little bit of context, um, we've already done a little bit of machine learning. So in our previous class, we talked about linear regression. So that was the idea that um, you could fit a line to some data points. And there might be two different reasons to do that. One is for extrapolating data outside the range of values you already have data for. The other is to fit data within the range that you already have data for. So that's interpolation. So both of these fall into the supervised machine learning um, category. But machine learning is this large, uh, diverse field of techniques that we have for statistical data analysis. And so uh, we're down here over in linear regression. That was sort of what we talked about last time. Now we're going to hop over into unsupervised learning in this class to talk about clustering. So clustering can be broken down into these little subcategories like hierarchical versus partitional clustering, and then hierarchical can be broken down into divisive and accommodative, and we'll talk about k-means. All right, so clustering is this word. Uh, it should bring to mind, hopefully, a few different examples of, um, uh, and if it doesn't, we'll cover those now. So. I'm going to open up a web page called yippee.com, which I'm sure that no one here watching this video has used the yippee.com browser. So this is a search engine, um, sort of similar, not, not in scale, but sort of similar in intent to Google and DuckDuckGo, if you've heard of those. So I'm going to type the word in data science. And it's going to go and find web pages related to data science. So it's sort of like what you'd expect the search engine to do, right? So you've got the, the results here, uh, the number of results. And then over here, you have something different. Right? So here you have topic clustering. So this is the idea of like, um, when I ask for the word data science, in what context do you mean, right? So do you mean like in the context of science or maybe in images or artificial intelligence? or social sciences, right? And then like each of these each of these topics related to data science have their own uh, subtopics. And so this is the idea of like, we have um, the association between words and we want to identify what that association is. So this is like the thing we searched for, but these are sort of nearby or adjacent topics. So that's one use of clustering. If you haven't thought of the fact that words are related to each other and there's some sort of separation distance that's sort of the, the concept being leveraged here. All right, so you can do that. Um, that's a meta search site. And another example is taking a 
a large number of customers and dividing them into small groups. So the concept here is called market segmentation. So if, if you're, this is typical when you're trying to sell something, you wanna tailor the method by which you're selling something to a narrow audience. The more specific your pitch is to the audience, the more likely they are to understand why they should buy your product. So understanding what categories should I break my audience down into in order to best tailor the message to each of them is, is another application of clustering. So you'll typically see this in, in sales um, of, of items. And the last um, example that I'll give you is uh, detecting anomalies. So if I have some uh, group of clusters here, so like visually you can see they're sort of well clustered, but then there's an outlier. And for you know this analysis, the outlier was associated with the red group. But if you were to rerun your analysis and maybe like look for another four colors, and you see like uh, these are all sort of clustering together as you would have expected, but this one changed colors. That's because the algorithm that you're running to sort of like identify the groups can't figure out which is the right group for this distant outlier. And so if you're looking for um, items that change groups when you uh, rerun your analysis, that would be an indicator that there is an outlier with respect to these groups. All right, so we've provided some examples of where clustering can be useful outside of sort of uh, outside of data science. Now we want to figure out how exactly do we do that. So as I mentioned in the preview, there's sort of two major methods, right? The partitional method, where you sort of divide up your data and then figure out whether that was the right division, or you can take a hierarchical approach and you can say for this given criteria, which items belong in that group. So it's sort of the order in which you're asking the question of groups and assignment. And then within the idea of hierarchical assignment, you have two different approaches. One is agglomerative and the other is divisive. And so this is the, the difference here is agglomerative is we're starting with individual data points and then figuring out whether any two pairs should be merged into a group. And then the opposite method is to start with a giant group and then divide it into smaller sets. All right, so now we've got the reason we do it. We've got the method and now we're gonna talk about the implementation. So let's cluster some actual numerical data. Right? So. If I had a whiteboard, I would draw some points on it and then I would ask for a volunteer, but here I'll just sort of play the role of the volunteer. So if I draw this axis and these data points and I say, could you please group these into three different groups? Your sort of first uh, action might be to say, well, these two look pretty close to each other and these three look pretty close to each other and this one looks pretty close. So in some sense, I've identified those three groups just sort of visually by looking at the spacing. That's pretty intuitive as far as I can tell. Like if you ask someone off the street, they'll be able to identify those three groups pretty readily. And it turns out that that is an actual algorithm called k-means. So to formalize a little bit, you first have to guess how many clusters there are. So that's the k value here. In this example, I was guessing that there were three clusters. And then I would guess where the center of that cluster was. And then I'd figure out, was that center an approximation that was appropriate for the data points in the cluster? So we'll go a little bit uh, more in depth on that step. But basically, the algorithm that you did visually is probably pretty close to what the k-means algorithm does. All right, so I'll, I'll pull up a notebook here that shows this in a Jupyter notebook, but then I'm gonna come back to the slides to actually do the visuals. So this uh, notebook is from Jake Vanderplas. He has a really good walkthrough of setting up the code for this. So I'll, I'll leave that in Blackboard for you to take a look at. But essentially we're importing matplotlib, numpy, and sklearn. And the sklearn is just to uh, help us make the data points in sort of like pre-arranged groups, and then to also do the distance measurement. I'll talk about where that comes in. So 
So this is basically some fake data generation. I'm going to specify in advance the number of clusters. And you might say, well, this is cheating, right? Well, but this is just a demo. So I get to choose, I'm going to make four data point, or four clusters. I'm going to have 300 data points. And I'm going to try and basically guess what those data points look like. So we'll get back to the, the, the actual visualizations. But all this is doing is we're setting up some plots here, and then it's making those frames. We'll come back to the, the data here. Make this bigger. Okay, so in this uh, first frame of analysis, we have there are 300 data points, and we uh, are going to guess the initial locations for the four um, centers of those um, clusters. So we guess that there's four. We randomly place some initial cluster locations. So it's just a complete guess, right? We have the first guess, number of clusters, second guess, where do we place the cluster centers? And then we ask the question, okay, given those four cluster center locations, which of the data points are most close to that center, right? So here's the center. Is this data point closest to this one? Yes, so then it's blue. Is this data point closest to this one? Yes, then it's blue. Right, so similarly, you just run through all the data points and you do look at all the measurements and you ask which data points are closest to that center, then that defines uh, the location of, or the assignment of all those data points. So we've just assigned all of the data points to one of the randomly located cluster centers. Okay, the next step is the move. So this is my old center location. And basically, I took all of the data points that I had assigned to be blue and asked, where exactly is the center of all of those data points? And so then I'm going to move the, uh, the center from the original location to the new, up, uh, new location. I'm going to do that for all four of my centers. So basically, I guessed the assignment of all my data points. Then I moved the location of my center to that new grouping. So the next step is throw away all the old assignments for all my old data points and given the current center locations, reassign the data points to a given center. So now we can see there was a, there was a significant change, right? So like this first step, um, I had to randomly place my centers and in pretty close to each other. And it turns out with one sort of like update, all the assignments now look much more correct. And so we're going to loop over this iterative search of uh, look at all the data points, measure the distance from the center, and then move and then reassign the assignments of the data points, and then move the data point center uh, to the new location. Uh, and then just we're going to repeat that. And notice that the second time we did it, that the distance became smaller. And so eventually this uh, distance move will be less and less as we get more and more uh, fixed on what the appropriate centers are. Um, and so eventually we'll just stop the algorithm when that update distance has gotten small enough. Okay. So the final clustering looks pretty intuitive and the steps that we took to get there primarily relied on that, um, all that, that the distance measurements about how far a given data point was from our guess. So you might be wondering, um, what if uh, we end up with something that's not quite as obvious here? So what if we have uh, initial data points that are not as clear? So the answer is you can just run those initial guesses for the location of the centroids repeatedly until you establish that the, uh, the outcomes are consistent. So the algorithm is very cheap generally, and so you can run it many times. And as long as the multiple results uh, lead to the same conclusion, you build some confidence that the, the outcome was correct. So, so it takes care, that, that's the address for how do we make a good guess for the, the centroids? The answer is you don't, you just run the algorithm many times. So there's another problem to think about uh, potentially, and that is how did we know how many uh, clusters of data there are? So like in, visually speaking, this was very easy to pick out that we should guess for, so that was visually obvious, but sometimes it's not as obvious. So there the answer is to uh, run 
multiple uh, number of guesses for how many center, how many clusters there are. So here, you know, if, is there one cluster of data? Is there two clusters of data? Is there three clusters of data? And every time that you rerun this algorithm, you're going to have uh, less and less distance error. And so eventually it will converge. And so the correct answer of how many clusters there are can be determined by this kink, right? So we have like this significant decrease in the in the dips in the distance and then there's not much improvement in the distance after we have too many clusters so the code for that uh, i'll just advertise that it exists if i can get over to it so all all we're doing to explore that analysis is the same set of code analysis from, from jake van der Plaats. And then we're going to rerun that algorithm multiple times. Uh, so we're just going to loop over that um, until we find convergence. And so that's where that plot is coming from, is just this additional snippet of code here. All right, so now that you've figured out um, that you need to run the algorithm multiple times to address the, the initial guesses for the centroids, and we also need to run multiple different uh, analyses for the number of clusters, um, the question is, we're confident that we've got the right outcome, but what does it mean? And so I've got these clusters of data, but how do I know what the unique identifying characteristics are for each distribution, or for each, uh, for each cluster? And so the, the suggestions there are to basically figure out you've got these clusters. Let's call them the, the green cluster and the yellow cluster and the purple cluster. So um, you might look at the attributes associated with each of those clusters. You might uh, use another machine learning technique called decision tree analysis to figure out what the attributes are uh, prioritized for each cluster. And then sometimes you might just have to manually dig through all of the data and see like what what is a distinguishing feature of this cluster. All right. So that's that's clustering. Uh, hopefully you understood uh, a little bit of the numerical analysis needed for it. It turns out we're not done though. Right. So we actually have uh, a whole another topic that seems pretty independent, and that's text analysis. So you have like, why are we talking about text analysis in the context of clustering? Right, and so it turns out there's a whole field dedicated to answering the question of how do we cluster text? All right, so a, a quick use case for this that um, you'll probably encounter in business quite often is someone shows up and says, hey, can you read these five documents? And you're like, yeah, that'll take a long time, but I can do it. Someone says, can you read these 100 documents? You're like, uh, how, much, how long is that going to take? And then you're like, 1,000 documents? I can't, I can't read 1,000 documents. Right, so there's some, some use cases where you really need to be able to ana analyze a lot of data. And in that, in that case, specifically, let's say 1,000 documents, looking at the number of words tells you nothing about the number, uh, the, the relevant um, sort of information in the document, right? So like, the the data about the document is not sufficient. You actually have to have some understanding of the text in the document. So you saw that example with the web pages, where you wanted to analyze, you know, millions of web pages to figure out which ones are clustered. You'd have to have some text-based analysis, not just line count or word count or last updated. All right. So how are we going to do that? You know, in order to do it, we're going to have to figure out um, a few sort of lower level techniques before we get there. Basically, we're going to start from scratch, right? So we're going to say that text is different than numerical analysis because with numbers, you can sort of like sort them, you can plot them on a graph, right? There's a, lots of analyses that we're familiar with now. But the unstructured data, which is text, uh, is much harder to grapple with, so that's why it's 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 almost its own subfield of analysis in data science. 
Right. So one might think, well, like math, right? So when we have the numbers, we can we can use math to manipulate those numbers. And and for linguistics, there's sort of the equivalent sort of grammatical rules and syntax. And so that's reasonable, right? So like all these languages have a grammar, but the problem is each of these languages also have exceptions. And so, you know, humans are somewhat complicated in their use of language, and there's lots of exceptions to all the grammatical rules in each language. So you're like, okay, well, you know, even if I get to an 80% solution, that might be useful. But then on top of the grammar rules, there's also variations in spelling. And most people don't spell everything correctly, and so you'll have to account for that, right? So like, the lack of a consistent grammar and the lack of sort of consistent spelling will really trip up most machine-based analysis. So we're gonna have to um, come up with some other methods here. So I'll give you an example of um, when I say a grammar rule that you might be able to leverage that at, at sort of naive analysis. If I wanted to take a document and split the document into sentences, I could say, well, everywhere there's a period, we'll just call that a, a new sentence. So here in the sentence, I'll show you that there's uh, one and then two and three sentences based on just counting the number of periods. So you could say, okay, that looks pretty straightforward. What could go wrong with that? Right? You'll almost out, like to every sort of expectation you have, you'll find some exception. So, for example, this sentence here has a period, two more periods, and then and then the actual period for the sentence. Okay, so we have four periods in a sentence, and then I have something like an abbreviation. So that's another five periods in this one sentence, right? And so, like, this is an example where for every sort of grammatical rule you'll think of there's some sort of exception that will throw you off. And normally that might not matter if you just have one document, but like I said, if we have a thousand documents, you're gonna see a lot of variation, especially when those thousand documents are written by a thousand different authors. So any hope for consistency and correctness are pretty much gone. So like I said, this is why there's a whole field called natural language processing. Um, it's, it's very big and it's sort of complicated. All right. So like I said, I like starting from first principles. So um, rather than try and like worry about the language problem right now, let's just focus on something simpler, which is just looking for text. Right. So you're probably already familiar with this in the sense of like, if I go to a website like library.umbc.edu, let's go there. I'm going to go to library umbc.edu. So on that web page, I want to find the word loan. So I'm going to type control F for, uh, and I'm going to search for the word loan. And I can find that text on the page. Right? So control F is super useful. And if you haven't seen it before, it's nice uh, to find things that you know you're looking for. Okay, so that works pretty well. What if I wanted to do something more complicated, like find an, an email address? Well, I don't actually know what email address I'm looking for at first, but I know they have at symbols. So let's, let's use, the, oh, there is an at symbol down here. And so that is part of an email address. So that's, that's convenient, right? We didn't know what we were looking for, but we were able to find it using the control app. So, we can search text, we know how to do that. We're pretty comfortable. But if we wanted to find any email address or say for instance, any phone number, those would be pretty complicated, right? So uh, there are there's text that has an at symbol that's not associated with the email address and there are phone numbers, there's so many variations, right? So you could have like a three numbers and then a dash and then another three numbers and a dash and then another four numbers. Or you could have a parentheses and three numbers and another parentheses and the space and you know the phone number variations are pretty significant. So we can identify the fact that there are some patterns to these these common sort of groups of text and so like I have some letters that precede uh, an at symbol followed by some more letters and so we want to be able to be able to describe to the computer these patterns of things we're looking for. 
And so it turns out that someone had already thought of this, and they called it regular expressions. And so the regular expressions are basically a symbolic language of identifying characters, right? So like if I say anything that's a number, 0 through 9, I'm going to call slash D. So that's the digit. And a phone number then would look like a digit, some other digit, and another digit, followed by a dash, three more digits, and a dash, and then four digits. So that'd be a, a, a phone number. And then there are alternative methods, so maybe I want to specify the numbers 0 through 9, and that would be equivalent to a dash D. So there's basically a little language here that you get to learn called regular expression. So let's go to a notebook and take a look at that. Close these, okay. Uh, so I've got a notebook here where I'm going to import the RE, regular expression library. And I've got some text here from a born text website. So this text has some, it's basically a big long string. It has words and sentences and commas uh, and misspellings and phone numbers. All right, so if I wanted to find, so here's a phone number that has 953 in it, but an area code. And then another phone number, which also starts in 953. All right, so if I wanna find the string, Five, nine, five, three, somewhere in that text, I can use find all. And all it does is just return the matching instances of that character string from this text. So it showed up twice. I got back a list of the two instances where it showed up. Not totally useful at this point, but sort of our first use case. Now I can ask sort of what the original question was. I wanna find all instances of a thing where I see three numbers, a dash, three more numbers, a dash, and then four numbers. So let's see what that shows us. Okay, now that's more interesting, right? We just found all of the things that look like phone numbers, right? So this, specifically this phone number and that phone number, it didn't catch this one because it wasn't an exact match to that pattern that we we're looking for. But we can sort of start to see the power of regular expressions where we want things that look like phone numbers. Okay, there's the list of all the phone numbers. So that's pretty handy. So in regular expressions, there's a million ways to do the same thing. So uh, in addition to the sort of zero through nine syntax, we can also say, I want a digit and I want three of them, right? So that's that three. And then I want another digit and I want three of those followed by another four digits, right? So that'll show, that'll return the same thing. It's a slightly different representation of the same idea though. All right. So as we sort of like assumed before, the email addresses in our text, let's see what those look like first. Uh, so here I've got an email address there. So I, I noticed that they have a, uh, some, some letters after the at symbol. So I'm gonna look for that, A through Z, that was that same syntax. So I get back a thing that is an at symbol followed by a letter, so it's either S or F in this case. That wasn't quite what I intended. What I probably really meant was I want the greedy search of um, the A through Z, as many of them as there are. So here, I got back two returns, SC and farm. So let's go find those in our text. So we got my name at sc.edu, and where's that other one? There we go, a person at farm.com. So it only returned the SC and the farm because it encountered that period and then stopped because it said that's not a match. So our match was we had SC and farm because we we're only looking through the, for the letters A through Z. Okay, so now maybe let's say I'm, I actually realize I want the, the, the part that precedes the at symbol, so I'm gonna include A through Z before the at symbol and I'm gonna do an on search on that side. So now we get something that looks pretty close to the, to the email address. So to get the complete email address, we have to do A through Z, and then the at symbol, another A through Z, and then a period, and then A through Z. And so that'll actually return both email addresses from this text. So again, now we've got something that's, as you know, looks sort of same concept as the phone numbers where we're matching on any email address that fits that pattern. That's pretty cool. 
you start to see that this gets pretty complicated though, right? Like, well, what are we really searching for? It'd be nice to have some sort of explanation. So here's a way of sort of laying out that same analysis. Um, and it gets the same results, but it's clearer to the user of why are we doing this, right? It's like, what are the, each of these groups of letters supposed to represent? Okay, so my last little warning here on emails is that uh, it's actually very difficult to construct a regular expression that captures all possible email addresses. Same thing for um, phone numbers, but let's take a look at that. Um, when I look for, uh, I'm looking through my regular expression library, I'm going to say, can you show me the different regular expressions that would capture emails? So I'm going to look for that. And I get back that there are 909 different regular expressions that people have posted to the regular expression library. And you'll see they get pretty complicated, right? So like this one is like a white space. And then these are the letters A through Z in both upper and lower case. And then there's either two or three letters, right? Because we could have like a .com, .edu, .us. Right? So there's different lengths there. And you can sort of like go as really complicated as you want, um, but there are lots of different methods that represent supposedly an email address. So it gets pretty complicated. All right, so we were using regular expressions so far for searches. So we did pattern matching, that's pretty cool. The other thing you can do with regular expressions is string replacement. So that's also pretty cool. Let's take a look at that. So here I have, I'm gonna find things Find patterns of strings where I have four digits. That's what that part says. And then this other part here says substitute, right, the, the dot sub, the XXX. So we have here, my phone number is 9452-953-XXX. Now, why would you want to do that? It might be the case that if I wanted to obfuscate the the the, the data and hide sort of the personally identifiable things from someone else, then I could hide the reg the, the phone numbers using these XXXs, right? Now we've still got the emails in there, so we don't want to clean those up too, but basically it's a way of finding patterns of data that you expect to be sensitive and then hiding them. Might be one example where you could use uh, substitution. Okay, so um, this Last sort of like split example here is if I have a list of lines, which I'm gonna warn you, this is the wrong way to make a list of lines, but we'll do it anyways. See what that looks like. So I've got all these lines because I split it on periods. And then I'm gonna say, I want to find all of the four digit um, expressions. And we're gonna run that against all of the lines here. So I can just make this happen this uh, this regular expression once and then I can apply it over and over on all my different instances of the lines. That'd be a, a case where I could compile it and sometimes it's faster and it matters but um, usually not. So. And then just again just to reiterate I can still even do that uh, documentation technique for compiled regular expressions. Okay so that's all I have for regular expressions. Um, basically you can do the searching for text or search and replace for text with patterns. All right. So it turns out, oh, I did not see that. So we've used regular expressions so far in plain English text, but it turns out that uh, wherever you see letters or even just generic patterns showing up, you can use regular expressions. So that's pretty exciting. Uh, so you can search through, say, genetic code for sequences of the uh, genome that you're interested in using regular expressions. So the one danger, once people start to learn about regular expressions, is they think they're going to use it everywhere. And then that becomes the new problem. So the, this is a sort of like a computer science question of like when to use a regular expression and when not to use it. Basically the most common mistake that people use is they use regular expressions to read HTML files. 
So HTML is not a regular language, and so you should not apply regular expressions to it. You can make arbitrarily complicated sort of constructs in HTML, so therefore regular expressions do not apply. All that really means in practice is that you should be using beautiful soup to parse HTML because beautiful soup is capable of handling HTML. All right. So we've got this ability to find strings in text. Uh, what are we going to do with it? Right. So usually the first thing is you're given this huge block of text. And in order to make the analysis more meaningful, you want to get rid of all the words that don't matter. So how do you know which words don't matter, right? That's, that's the real tricky part. Right? So for instance, here I've gone through and I've sort of manually uh, indicated which, which words probably aren't sort of really relevant. Like you can read just the black words and sort of get a concept of what's going on. But doing it manually with short words is probably a bad approach, right? So like if I say uh, the word Ben is short, right, that's my name, I wouldn't want to throw that out. And so it turns out figuring out which words are relevant to keep and which words are not relevant to keep, that's a, a problem in natural language processing. So there's a library to handle that problem. All right, so let's go over to that. We'll do a quick example of what the NLPK, Natural Language Toolkit Library, provides. So the Natural Language Toolkit uh, is this uh, library that allows you to parse text and remove what are called stop words. So the stop words are all the sort of words that are typically not relevant to the meaning of the text. So I'm going to use uh, the this text right here. So this should look familiar now. You've got this thing that you want to figure out which words are most relevant for analysis. Um, those are the ones that I'm going to have to, the, the ones that we're removing are called stop words. The ones that we are left with are the words that we're going to run our analysis on. Okay, so previously in my, in my other notebook, I showed you that I was splitting on sentences. That's a bad idea because you could have abbreviations or uh, sort of titles with period in them. And so the natural language toolkit provides a sentence tokenizer and a word tokenizer. So all this, these are just fancy words for the idea of taking a big block of text and splitting it into sentences. That's the sentence tokenizer. And then you can take a sentence and you can split it into words. That's the word tokenizer. So here, this, this list should look pretty familiar in the sense of that's what I did previously with the splitting on periods. Um, so that's the sentence tokenizer. Then we can do the same thing for the word tokenizer, right? So I've got these each sentence that we captured here from the sentence tokenizer. We're now going to split on the words. So I'm left with a list that looked like that. All right, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the stop words. So the stop words are things like the and on and to, words that don't really contribute to the relevance of the sentence. So if we look at what are the stop words that NLPK provides, it's all the words that you typically wouldn't associate with anything sort of like driving the purpose of the sentence, although they make it more understandable to humans. So this is a relatively long list of words. And what we're going to do is we're going to go through this list of words and remove all the instances of the stop words. Right? So there's 179 stop words. And I can remove the stop words from that, uh, from each list. And what I'm left with is I go to store a car parked, many cars parked moving. Right? So Hopefully, uh, these sentences are still understandable in some sense, but they don't include any of the, the words that don't, that sort of string the sentences into words. String the words into sentences. So this sentence, I don't know exactly what it is about, but soap, bathing, bathtub, shower. It's something about bathtub, right? So let's go and look at what that original sentence was.
Soap can be used for bathing, be it in a bathtub or in a shower. That was the original sentence, right? So we can go all the way back up here. Soap can be used for bathing. It can be, it, be it in a bathtub or a shower. That's the original sentence. Here it is as a list. And then after I remove the stop words, we still sort of like get the gist of the sentence, even though uh, it's not very clear uh, to a human what that is. But this is this reduced list here is what we care about for the uh, sort of text analysis purposes. So this is basically the preparation step for our data analysis. The specific list of stop words doesn't typically matter. You can sort of like tune your stop, loop, stop word list to be uh, more appropriate to the specific data set you're working with. But in some sense, cleaning, cleaning up the data doesn't have to be perfectly correct. So there's lots of different lists of stop words available. You're welcome to use whatever stop word list is available. Okay, so this was our document cleaning. We've typically gotten rid of the text, uh, the stop words, we've gotten rid of punctuation, and now we're, um, we're gonna identify which words sort of typify a document. So this is called document clustering. So the, the most common, most uh, the easiest to understand is called term frequency inverse document frequency. This is TFIDF. The essential idea is, if I have a large number of documents, if a word shows up in all of those documents, that word does not uniquely identify any document, because it's common. But if there's a word that only shows up in a few of the documents, then that word identifies the sort of topic relevant to that document. So uncommon words that are specific to a few documents can be useful for clustering that set of documents. So the sort of data structure that we're gonna use here is just a big table. And the table is the list of words that you have. So this is all of the words from all the documents. And then this is a list of the document names. And so we're gonna basically count, the algorithm that we're gonna use is gonna count how many times does this term show up in this document, and, and it shows up 10 times. Does this term show up at all in the second document? No. All right, so you can sort of like, the, the rows are how many times did this word show up in each document? And then the, the other way to think about it is the column is how many uh, instances of that word showed up in the document. So if we look for a word that shows up in only one or two documents, and that means that that word sort of like gives us a sense of what those documents is about. All right, so back uh, earlier in the semester, there were a bunch of essays. And so I've collected all of that text and we're gonna run the TF IDF algorithm against that collection of documents. All right. So this notebook will be available in Blackboard for your use. Um, the other sort of thing that I'm, I'm th throwing in in this notebook is a doc string test. So I have a doc, I have a, a definition here for a function in Python, and the the real analysis here of the um, of the of the function is carried out in the return statement here. But all this stuff in red. So there's like a triple quote, and then some text, and then these uh, sort of triple carrots here, followed by another three quotes. All of this is called a doc string. So the doc string allows us to specify what the document or what the function in Python should be doing. So this is like, this first part is like a text description for humans. And then this other part shows us how we should expect to use the function. So there's a super cool um, approach in, in Python called doc test, where you can actually specify sort of not just what you expect it to do, but you can actually verify that the function does this. 
So I'll show you what I mean. I'm going to execute this cell, and then I'm going to say run the doc test for the function um, that's available. And I'll get back that I had no failures. That means that this function, when I run it, is actually performing um, with these inputs, and it, and it produces that output. So the term frequency is our first function that's just saying how many uh, how many times a word appears in a document. So if my if my input word is ASDF and I have a document with these words in it, then the number of times that this word shows up in this document is one third. That's all it's telling us. So now I can ask um, for uh, a given so number of documents containing uh, then the number of documents containing a word. So I'm going to say my collection of documents is this here. So this is three documents. So a document with these words, another document with this word, and another document with this word. So three documents, the collection of words, and I'm asking how many times does this word show up in that collection of documents? And the answer should be one. So again, if I run that cell and then run the doc test, uh, I got back that it worked. So no failures. This is actually what the function does. And then the, uh, the other function that we'll need is we'll want to count how many uh, words are in the document corpus. So a corpus is just a collection of the documents. So this this right here, all doc, is serving as our corpus. All right. And then lastly, we have our TF-IDF algorithm. So again, it's a very small code here. And we're just getting back the score for uh, a given word. So if I want to say like, I'm looking for this word, and I want to rank its importance for this document with respect to this collection of documents. We're taking in three different arguments there. All right, so now we've got all of the functions are passing the test, which means they do what they say they do. And I'm going to run, uh, I'm going to use those functions against the collection of essays that I've gotten from week three. So I go through, basically this is the cleanup process. So I'm looking through all of these files and I'm looking at the, the, the words in those files. And here I'm just displaying the count for that. Okay, I've got 24 documents and the total number of words used in those 24 documents is 1265. Okay, there are no repeats. And so I'm going to take um, all of my uh, Word documents and place them into a single dictionary. So I've got a dictionary where the key is the name of the file and the, uh, the score of all the terms in the document is stored as the value. I'm going to display, so I'll come back to those cells, but basically for a given document, what the TF-IDF algorithm does is it tells us which words are most uh, identified with this specific document. So the words, let's start at the bottom here. So the word go and the word data are not very indicative of this uh, file. They, they're very common in other words. Whereas the words fix and naming and learn are uh, highly associated with that specific document. So again, um, because all of these essays are on data science, the word data is showing up um, as a very common word, which is sort of the expected result. Okay, so in these three documents, the word data showed up in, as the most common words. Um, so if we look at this one essay, the word exploring was unique uh, in some sense, or more the document uh, was strongly correlated with the, the word exploring compared to other documents in this set of documents. 
Okay, so how did we get all that? So this, um, we, we looped through all of the documents and then we ran the TF-IDF algorithm on that and we got back for each uh, word in the document the, the ranking for a given word in the document. Okay, so again, this notebook will be uh, posted to Blackboard. So the homework uh, is going to rely on text analysis. So I'm going to give you a collection of text files, and what I want you to what I want to get uh, back from you is a, a notebook that produces a file with the DAT extension, and I want the contents of the file to look like the following: the name of the file with, uh, wrapped in double quotes followed by a colon, followed by a unique list of words in that uh, file. So well, I want you to remove all the, all the uh, punctuation, and I want you to remove the um, words that are duplicates. So I want only this word to show up once, and then the other word in the document to show up once. Right? And so all of these words will be in this file. I think uh, the other assignment here is a reading assignment. No, sorry. Yeah, so you should uh, send me an email. This will be week nine. So. And then the other, so, so basically send me a status report of your uh, progress after an hour. And the other uh, is a reading assignment for regular expressions. 